Church, please join me in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we have begun this season of Lent as we reflect upon our sin that made the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, necessary. Father, during this time, not only expose the way we fall short to the law, but comfort us by the grace of Jesus Christ. In this time, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit descends upon this place and fills our hearts and minds as we hear your voice. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These words should sound familiar to those of us who attended our Ash Wednesday service this past week. Because these are the words we hear every year as we receive the sign of ashes on our foreheads. They are the fateful words that, as a result of humanity's sin, sealed our fate. That no matter how wealthy or poor or famous or unknown or righteous or unrighteous we are, we will all face death and our bodies will return to the dust. It's appropriate that this first Sunday in Lent would begin with one of the most tragic passages in all of Scripture, the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. From this event comes the divide between God and creation that we, sadly, still experience and live in to this day. Yet remember that these opening chapters of Genesis are not just history. They're not just facts of things that happened a long time ago. But they tell us something about all of humanity's condition, and this story is no exception. When considering the story, I've often heard a lot of people, but primarily women, joke about, wait until I get my hands on Eve when I get to heaven. Or I'm going to give Eve a piece of my mind when I get to paradise for causing us all this trouble. And as funny as it is, it can give the impression that sin is all Eve's fault. Or it's all because of her and Adam's screw-up that we now suffer the consequences of sin. But our Genesis reading is about more than just their story. But as God's inspired word, it is all about all of our stories as humanity. And here's how our story begins. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The more that we read and reread this verse, I find the more questions seem to come up for us. First, who is the serpent? Second, if the Garden of Eden is meant to be this perfect paradise, then how does this crafty, lying serpent get in? And why would God make this serpent at all? For curious minds, there's bad news. Because the story never tells us exactly. For reasons we may never know, the Holy Spirit left those details out of the inspiration in this story. But in thinking about this, isn't sin so often like the serpent? Isn't sin this senseless, harmful force that at times seems to come out of nowhere? There's a beautiful poem by Samuel Coleridge called The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. And if you haven't heard the poem yourself, you're probably familiar with the line, water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. There's a lot that happens in this poem, but at the beginning we're told of a ship that's lost at sea in the Arctic. It's freezing cold, it's foggy, there's ice slowing their journey down, and we're told there's little hope for the ship's crew and they might unfortunately die. But then suddenly a large bird, an albatross, comes descending from the clouds and begins to guide the ship to safety. And so the crew realizes by following the albatross, the ship is able to navigate through the ice and get to where they're going to. So on this journey, everyone seems to be relieved that things are going well as long as they follow this albatross. But then the poem takes a sad and shocking turn. When the mariner is asked, why look thou so? He replies, with my crossbow, I shot the albatross. What? Why? Why would he shoot the albatross? It was helping them. It was their friend. It was guiding them to safety. It makes no sense. The poem never tells us why the mariner killed the albatross. And by the end of the poem, 
It doesn't matter why. What matters is he killed the albatross. It happened. There's no taking it back. And his senseless act crashes into the world of this poem. And the rest of the story shows us how the mariner faces the consequences. How often do we look at the sins of others and think, what on earth were they thinking? Maybe we can even look back on our own past sins and wonder, gosh, what was I thinking? Sin is often senseless and irrational, and yet we do it anyways. So the serpent, this unnatural force or disruption that comes crashing into the story, continues. He says to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. First, notice how the serpent singles out the woman, or Eve, in this story. Why would that matter? Well, remember, when God gave the command, you shall not eat of the tree of knowledge, Eve was not created yet. She was not in the picture. So in this situation, Eve is more vulnerable because she didn't hear the command directly from God himself. But before we let Eve off the hook, she shows us that she knows the law of the land. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve knows it is out of God's bounds to eat the forbidden fruit. But listen to the serpent's reply. He says, you will surely not die. Temptation will always contradict the word of God. God says you will die. The serpent says you will not die. God is wrong. God's word is a lie. Here's what's really going on. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So in this picture, what is sin? It is the belief that we know better for ourselves than God does. We know God's word says one thing, but despite that, we say, well, maybe God wasn't right about that. Or maybe sin isn't as serious as God makes it out to be. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. It's interesting that the story tells us the tree was good For food. In other words, the fruit on the tree by itself was good, edible, even delicious fruit. It was a delight to the eyes, like the best produce you could find at the market. So then what makes this fruit so bad? It's God's word. It doesn't matter how ripe or delicious or nutritious this fruit is. God has spoken his word, no, you shall not eat. This shows us that sin is a twisted or inward-oriented version of something God has created for good. Eating, for example, is a blessing from God. But gluttony is a twisting of this blessing for our selfish desires. Intimacy is a blessing from God. But outside of marriage, it becomes inward-oriented and self-serving. It's easy to fall into the trap of, it doesn't look bad, it doesn't feel bad, and it's all part of how God made us, so what's the big deal? But then we continue, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. In a shocking twist in the story, we find out Adam was there the whole time. He heard the law directly from God himself, so if anyone was in authority to say no, it was him. But why didn't he speak up? Whoa, wait a minute, Eve. Didn't God say? There's a quote often attributed to Edmund Burke, which goes, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in the world is that good men stand by and do nothing. So Adam, this man created for good, stands by and does nothing. He fails in his role as man and as husband and falls under the same temptation as Eve. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, 
and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Before this, we're told that humanity lived in the garden with God naked and unashamed. Above all else, this means that between God and humanity, there was absolutely nothing to hide. There was no sin. There was no embarrassment or shame, but humanity could live in complete freedom with God. But with sin comes shame. With sin comes embarrassment, insecurity. So the symbol of nakedness is now a threat to humanity. We can't be completely free with God because look at who I am. Look at what I've done. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Here, the cool of day means that it was evening which tells us when humanity fell, there was darkness over the garden. Remember our previous message about salt and light, and with sin comes this spiritual darkness that covers their world. So in this moment of shame and despair, where should Adam and Eve turn for safety? To God, to their creator who loves them and wants to have a relationship with them. But what do they do instead? They try to find safety in the darkness, in the shadows. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Up until this point, we've learned that God is a speaking God. His voice has the power to make things come about. Let there be light and there's light. So here, the same voice God uses to speak creation into being uses his voice to call out to his precious creation, where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Just in these few verses, we learn so much about how sin affects our relationships with one another as human beings. If you keep reading from this point forward in the Bible, Adam and Eve never speak a single word to each other again. Before sin, it was bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But with sin, we see blaming, finger pointing, criticizing, and ignoring Sin not only separates us from God, but it separates us from one another. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So Adam points to Eve and Eve in like turn points to the serpent. Nobody is willing to own up to their actions completely. But this marks another important point. But just as there's no separation Between God and humanity, there was also no separation between humanity and creation. But in the fall, we see that union is broken. Sin disrupts our union to God. It disrupts our union with one another and disrupts our union with creation. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. And dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Notice where the serpent is cursed to. On the belly you shall go. And dust you shall eat all the days of your life. The serpent is cursed to eat dust. And where again are we cursed to as humanity? For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. So what do we make of this? The serpent eats us. Apart from God, we are cursed to be ruled over and consumed by our sin. Like Adam and Eve, we know who God calls us to be and what he calls us to do. We just read the Ten Commandments and many of us have heard them day in and day out for our entire lives. 
But does knowing the Ten Commandments by heart always prevent us from breaking them? Adam and Eve knew the law, but they broke it anyways. And such is the case each time we sin against God, against each other, and against creation. But let's not overlook the final verse of this story. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. In another strange twist in the story, after declaring the consequences of humanity's sin, God covers their shame. He covers their nakedness. And not only that, but Adam and Eve are not killed that day. Instead, God kills an animal and uses its skin to cover Adam and Eve. This is the first instance of death that we see in the Bible. And it teaches us something peculiar about God. That despite humanity not deserving it, God still loves humanity. He loves humanity so much that he would offer another life in our place to cover our sin and shame. Throughout the rest of the story of Holy Scripture, we're reminded of this great mercy of God to put another life in our place. And so for us, this animal is a type of Jesus Christ, the one whose life is offered in our place to cover our sin and shame. The sin of Adam and Eve led to the death of this animal, and our sin is what led to the death of Christ upon the cross. But he died so that we may live seeking to forgive and clothe us continually with his abundant righteousness. We confess that because of sin, we will return to the dust in this life. And apart from God, we live in the danger of being consumed by the sin that so often tempts us. Yet we have hope in Christ that dust is not our final state. In him, we are more than dust. But in him, we have the Holy Spirit breathed into us to give us life. So in those times of sin and disobedience, let us resist our urge to run away or hide from God further in the shadows. Instead, let us run to Jesus in the light of day, saying, Lord, I am a sinner. Lord, I have fallen short of your law. Lord, have mercy on me. As the law continues to do its work in revealing our sin throughout Lent, let us cling to the covering of Christ that hides our shame. May the word of God continually call us away from that which is good and pleasing in our eyes and toward that which is good and pleasing in his eyes. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.